Noreen Lynch, you're very, very welcome to the podcast. How are you keeping today? I'm great, Rory. It's lovely. I'm sitting here looking out at Spanish Point and chatting with you. Sure. Isn't life lovely? <laughs> lovely. Great. It's great to be able to have the chats. And um, exactly. I get a sense from you that you have a, a huge, huge affinity with Spanish Point. Can you uh, maybe explain that and also maybe give me the origin stories of where Spanish Point came into your life? Mighty. Well, where it came into my life, let's be honest, my father's from Milltown, uh, the, the bog road heading down towards Spanish Point. So all our lives, this has been where I have cousins and family, um, where I'm connected. And it's a place in our family. Always, we all have this notion we're going to end up back over here somehow. So I've always had a fondness for it. I'd come mm. here regularly. Whenever I found I was making a big decision, I would find myself in Claydock up in the headland there sitting. And I'd say, OK, this is obviously where I needed to make my decision. So I've always had a fondness. And then an opportunity came up. I um, spent many years involved in working for diocese and parish, kind of like community development work, but yeah. with parish groups. And I just felt I needed to move from training people into nourishing people. I just felt in myself there was a shift. I had done a lot of training work and setting up groups, and I thought, I think my time is done. And I moved into in Dublin working in a retreat centre, a spirituality centre. And the chance came up to come back to Spanish Point. And while I loved where I was in Dublin in Glasnevin, I knew, I always knew I'd end up back here. So I have to say it. With great sadness to leave Dublin, I danced down the road. <laughs> um, and I'm just thrilled. So I've come to a place called the FCJ Spirituality House. And it's it has a lovely history because originally um, there was houses built all around Spanish Point for large, well-off families that would have come here for holidays in the 1800s, back when the Atlantic Hotel was here in 1810 and around that time. And one of the houses that was built in the um, the late 1800s was for a family to come here. And then from the 1930s on, the FCJ sisters just used to rent it for holidays. Got it in the 60s and the 80s, it just wasn't fit for purpose. It was knocked and rebuilt. So somehow we've managed uh, to have this most beautiful place that's a field off the sea in Spanish Point. And it's become a place, especially since the 80s when they rebuilt it, that there's been loads of people have come for retreats, for days of silence, for weeks of silence. Uh, for holidays, all kinds of things. And then last year, the sisters, the FCJ sisters approached me and said, we've had sisters here, you know, running different retreats, but we'd really like to see what's possible for the whole year round. So they invited me to see what can we do for the winters, for all year round to make this a space that people can just soak up the goodness mm -hmm. of it and enjoy it. So that's kind of the journey that got me here. There's loads more in between, but a general fondness for Clare and West Clare has always been a big part of my life. And I feel like, I kind of feel like different parts of my life have come together and landed me here. And that's a great joy. It's a challenge, but it's a great joy to kind of say. Lovely, that. lovely. Um, can you maybe take me back and, and tell me a little bit about your father and, and your, your family in general and, and maybe s some of your own upbringing and w yeah. what, did, what was life like for you growing up and where? Well, I'm, I'm a city kid. I grew up in Limerick City, uh, the eldest of, of four in Cardavan, which was a new estate when I was born. Even the boundaries and the roads weren't finished in the estate I grew wow. up in. And I often felt as a child that below us to the right was Napiershig, which is now a really well-known GA club. And it's the other religion in our family. Um, and to the left was this whole housing estate. Um, and I remember as a, a young teenager writing an essay about living in the in-between place, being on the edge of the country and the edge of the town. Um, and so I grew up, I suppose, always conscious. My mum's from North Kerry, dad's from Milltown. Um, always conscious of being of the land without really being connected. I used to think I was a country girl until the first time I was somewhere with no lights at night and I realised I couldn't cope at all. <laughs> so that was the realisation that I was living in, in two places. But I always had that kind of an affinity, not necessarily for farming because I didn't understand what mm. I was talking about, but really for being by the sea, being in edge places. Um, as I say, I went off when I when I finished school and with Salesians in Limerick, I went, um, did a bit of study around computers and that. But really, my heart was in working with people. And I got the opportunity to take a year off, which brought me on a journey, really. I'm one of those people who started being involved in church pastoral work at a time when there was no structure for it. So um, I, I ended up in Munich in Germany. We had an Irish parish there. So for five years, I was in Munich mm. having a great time with all the young people who'd arrive. And they'd say to me, I never went to church in my life, but it was great to come in and hear Irish accents here. And we'd just, you know, kind of mind each other and journey mm. the road together. Mm. Came back. I've worked in various parts of the world doing um, Ireland, or various parts of Cork, Kerry, Clare, Limerick, um, Dublin, doing different things around pastoral development, mainly trying to empower people to run their own communities, to own what's happening in their communities. Mm. Um, 
And somehow, as I say, found myself here, back here in the place that really nourishes my soul. Um, I suppose um, uh, dad, as I say, is from, from up the road in, in Briafa, a family still there. I won't embarrass them by, by discussing them on, on radio. <laughs> there's, nothing, there's nothing worse than hearing you were talked about on radio without being told you were going to be. But uh, they're from up there, Briafa, that part of the world, beautiful part of the world. Um, lots of history. I'm conscious that uh, next week Dermot Petty's play is going to be on this Saturday, actually, is going to be on um, uh, talking about the Renine ambush. There's we've plenty of connections and history mm. and all those kind of things there. And just a real sense of, you know, what I notice when I come back here now when I'm here of going gently with life. Um, I really notice how fast I've been living. And, and I suppose all of us have had that experience in lockdown where when we were forced to stop, we began to notice what we liked about slowing down and what we needed about keeping going, mm. trying to find a new balance. Um, and I, one of the things I just be conscious of, for example, I speak very quickly and people will have noticed that in the first minute I was talking there, I speak very quickly and slowing down and saying, just think about what you're saying or just be present. You find it's, it's easier in a, pl a place, it's a country place as such where people are busy, but actually they're careful of each other and mind each other because mm. we live together. And sometimes in the city, we forget that we need each other. I found the great gift of lockdown in the city. I was in Dublin for the actual lockdown and I found the great gift of being in a flat, seven flats in one house and we all discovered each other and we all started having tea outside in the, the backyard and somebody started growing lettuce in all the gaps in between the paving stones. So when you'd walk out in the in the yard, there was lettuce growing up and tomato plants in, in corners and we all wow. started talking to each other. Yeah. And, you know, we realized how in a city we just didn't notice each other somehow. Yeah. And so I find being here, I've just noticed I have slowed um, in a soft way, not in a, a forced way. And I'm trying to just enjoy that and not fill up the spaces with noise, you know. Mm. So I feel very privileged, I have to say. I feel like um, if you'd asked me what my dream job was, I would have described something like this to come back to the West Coast and to be able to offer spaces for people to just come and stay and be apart from you know the busyness so they get nourishment and energy for the road ahead um and somehow somehow i've landed here and it's i so i was up in Doolin last night playing tunes i'm here today chatting with you i'll have people in this evening for meditation it's just a gorgeous way of living so it's good for me as well as what it's offering everybody else and um, mm. that's that's class i think you know? Absolutely. It's, it's, it sounds like living a dream, as people say. Um, so obviously, music is uh, a huge part of your life, and it's partly what we're to talk about today in, in terms of your own song, singing, voice, creativity. Um, can you maybe go back to the beginning of that and also where music entered your life? Yeah, I think I suppose, um, again, like most people, uh, I think of, of car journeys when we were children. And my dad is a lovely singer, um, but would be one of those shy people who in Milltown, if you asked him, did he play an instrument? He'd say, I know we were more sporting, really. But then he'd pick up a, a button accordion and play a tune and he'd say, I, I can't really play anything. He'd put it down. He might have got a harmonica and play a tune because it was just in him because everybody did it. It was what you did in the evening, somebody the bit of visiting houses or whatever. But there was, you know, his sense would be, you know, there was people who were good at that now and I'd only be messing. Uh, so in the car, dad would often sing when we'd be driving places and thinking back to the 70s, like when you'd, there wouldn't be a seatbelt between the whole lottie and somebody would be sitting in between the two front seats of the parents and we'd sing songs and he'd teach us songs. And, you know, I remember discovering uh, Nora Daly that um, Michael Russell sings and uh, and a few other people, but discovered dad had been singing that for years and we just thought it was the same as a wheelie wheelie walla. And then you'd hear Michael Russell singing, oh God, it's part of a tradition and you'd learn a few extra verses. And so... We loved singing and music growing up, but wouldn't have considered ourselves, you know, but stand. I know, of course, all of us, you know, got a guitar and played it in the bedroom or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but then I suppose what helped me really was when I went to work in that Irish parish in Munich, they just said to me, you have to do the folk choir every month, every Sunday. And they handed me a guitar and I was like, oh, I don't really sing. But I found myself in a position where when people came in to church, the one thing you could give them was something they recognised. Mm. So if you'd sing something they recognised or something very easy, yeah, like a kind of folk gentle thing, people forgot to be nervous. And once they had sang together, then mm. they talked to each other. And it was a very unconscious thing. Um, we also had this hilarious thing that we would just say five o'clock is, is rehearsal and six o'clock is church. So whoever turned up. So I used to be sitting there 
there could be 16 guitars or there could be a button accordion and a clarinet. I had no idea what would arrive. So we used to have just hilarious moments beforehand going, OK, it'll all be fine. Um, but that actually developed a muscle in me. And I suddenly found myself able to sing and, and kind of people saying to me in, when we'd be inside in the pub, then watching after the rugby match, they'd say, Noreen, sing a song, sure you have a guitar. And suddenly I was pulled out of myself. And I always really appreciate that because I would have said, sure, I can't. That's for professionals. Mm. Mm. I'm a city kid. I didn't grow up in a tradition. Mm. When I came back to Ireland, I came back to count to Cork, actually, after a bit of traveling, I was in Cork and I discovered the Spalpeen Fawnock and the Spalpeen Fawnock have a weekly singers club. And I remember saying to friends, I'd love to go to the singers club and hear old songs. And they kept saying, you just sit there. You just sit there and listen to people singing and then you sing one song. Is that what it is like? Is that what nobody talks? And I said, yeah, it'll be great. Um, so you either get that or you completely mm, don't. Yeah, totally. And, um, so I went and I loved it. They were amazing. And, you know, people would tell stories. There'd be somebody sitting there talking about when they were used to fish on, in the Liffey and then they couldn't anymore. And they'd have a song about it or they'd talk about a road or a personality. And I remember leaving Claire or leaving Cork and thinking, that's it. I'll never again encounter anything like that. And I wrote that song, Note, Note of Truth, that, that some people hear me sing about the freedom of singing together and that it's not just about a once off, you know, or recording a song that doesn't make it special. It's actually that moment when you hear it mm. that you might never hear it again, but somebody's mm. passing on something from their parents, from their community. Um, and I came to work in Limerick and started stay, living outside in Clare. And somebody said to me, uh, go to the Fecal Festival. They have a whole day of singing. They have a whole day. The, the Fecal Festival on the Saturday is in Maloney's pub, it's just singing all day. It goes on until our, the early hours. And when I was there, I started going to a trad session. And from that, you know, it, it just kind of evolved. And I suddenly just, I remember going to the South Ross Common Singers Festival, which is a whole weekend in Halloween, the end of October. And I remember arriving and said, I can't believe there's like a whole weekend of people singing old songs. That's mad. I didn't realize there was loads of those weekends, mm. but everything was this discovery. And the experience for me all the time was welcome. Um, because I would have, you know, you'd come to something like that and say, well, I have nothing to offer, but I, I'm, I, you know, I'm interested in this. I like the old songs. I like the stories. And you'd find somebody would say, yeah, have a look at that one. Try that one. Come back and sing it next week. Um, and so I became really convinced from early on, whether it was through that church folk choir or the singer slubs, that what singing often allowed was community. It allowed you to arrive in, like you could arrive at a singer's club and know nobody. And nobody would, you'd sit in anywhere and between songs you talk to people. So there's no cliques. You can't, I'm sure there are some, but you can't really form cliques if you're listening. Um, if you're trying to do something together. You, so it became very important to me. And so, and Rin and myself actually have a, a monthly song club here, singing circle here. And the whole thing we keep saying is whoever is here makes the circle. And out of that comes gorgeous experiences. People will arrive and say, no, I wouldn't pass. And I just come to listen. I couldn't possibly. And halfway through the night, they'll say, well, I brought the words of something just in case. Mm. And they start opening out something and it might be a poem or it might be a song. And there's a richness, not just for the, you know, not just for the content offered, but for the being willing to, to trust each other a little bit. So I suppose there's that whole journey. And then in terms of me singing myself, I mean, of course, I landed into Brogan's and Ennis a few times um, like that because it was very easy to land into and not know people. There was always a few people from the different places I'd been. You'd always bump into a gang and just sang a few songs. And Owen O'Neill, the Owen and Quentin used to do the, the sessions there mainly and just said, come on, we have to record something. And I remember saying to friends, like, I'll never do something like this again in my life. So I might as well have a bit of fun at it and record one song. I can say I was in a recording studio. It's a little bucket thing ticked off. And sure, of course, in player, once you do anything, they say to you, uh, when's the album coming out? <laughs> <laughs> so I think I kind of accidentally fell into a lot of stuff and I'd enjoy it. And I, you know, I'd, I, I think the more you do of anything, the more you're ambitious for it and the more ideas you have. What about and what if? But there's just that sense really of, of creativity and of sharing stuff really just to connect and to build up people. And, you know, I love doing it. I love singing. Um, I get great joy. I was saying last night in Doolan, it was ages since I'd been at a session, you know, and really sat and sang and played. And again, people just coming up and saying, God, you know, we're here from California. We're here from Vancouver. We're, we're you know, this is such a great experience to hear. And, and I, I just think it's such a gift um, that movie, The Job of Songs, is out at the moment. 
um, we were listening to and they were talking about how people come into a space and say, I can't articulate why this matters. But I came here on a once in a lifetime trip because my great grandfather left in a boat. And somehow when you sang that song, I got emotional. It brought me into something mm -hmm. that some connected deep spirit that I can't articulate. And Luca Bloom in the movie calls that the job of songs, that it allows people into that moment. And I just I, I think that um, that companionship of music and song, of creativity, of allowing ourselves to be vulnerable together mm -hmm. and to to enjoy life. You know, there's a great phrase somewhere that beauty is what brings you to truth. Beauty, beauty is what brings you to the, to the divine. Um, and I think if you look down along the west coast of Europe, there's monasteries and things from medieval times the whole way down. So people who were trying to get away from the noise all went to what they thought was the edge of the world. They all kept going west. And if you go the whole way down, right down to um, the south of France, you'll find these monasteries and, and places people went. And I think there's something about coming out here. Some mornings when I go out and I open the front door and the wind would knock you sideways here, you know. And you think it strips away everything and there's just something beautiful and something primeval left. Um, like a song, just something very stripped away, like singing unaccompanied. Mm. And when you've nothing left, then you're then you're then you're really present. Mm. Okay, now, what is when all the noise and all the phones and all the everything else is gone? So that's a lot of words, sorry, for someone who's talking about music. <laughs> Not at all. Um, so where where do you get, um, I mean, in the middle of going to all these uh, song circles and, and uh, weekends and running the centre and everything else, I'm I'm actually not getting a sense of like, the quiet um. time in any of this. <laughs> and maybe it's also just as we record this, we're coming out of the summer, but uh, maybe the, and you do find that particularly on the West Coast that the winter can be a little bit more of the quieter, reflective space. I think that's a really interesting question, Rory, because so, for example, a lot of the places I named are, you know, it's over years I've been in different things and involved in different yeah, places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I've moved from, I was training lots of people, running courses, running events, which were, you know, I was always in the car driving and I said, I need to step out of that busyness. Mm. And in Dublin, I was involved in a day centre, so you were busy, but you went home in the evening and I've moved into a residential place. So we're going to, from the end of November, have... 12 rooms that are open, people can come and stay. And it's that's the big question that I'm dealing with. Like, how do you boundary and balance? Mm. Um, because I'm becoming more and more clear that you can't say in a day center, you can offer events, you can bring in a speaker, you can bring in, a, you know, have beautiful meditation events and then go home. But in a place you invite people into a residential pay, place, it needs to be the way the house is that you invite people into an experience, not just an event. Um, and so we, I was actually at a gathering of people from different retreat centers last week, and we were talking about how we need to embody what we're doing, because if if what we're doing is saying on Friday evening, there's a group coming. So from lunchtime, I'll be holy. And then on Monday, I'll relax and just run around the place like a headless chicken. You actually can't. It's fake. So the, the need to consistently be still like I'd find the mornings very important trying to have a bit of space in the morning um, because the evenings mm. just fail and there's people coming and there's things happening. Um, but you, you know that people know that thing. You can't give from an empty cup. You can't pour from an empty cup. You can't um, be present to people if you're not present to yourself. Um, and and I think it, that is the balance. And when I said that one of the gifts of coming here is that the whole world is coming together for me. Um, what I often had before this was I would work maybe in Limerick or in Dublin, but I lived in Clare. So in a lot of ways, I could be be different people in different places. Mm. And there was a bit of splintering in that. You know, you could be talking all the talk and then you'd come home and you'd run around getting to everything and you'd maybe have a day where you crashed and slept and then you'd go out again. And as we emerged from lockdown, I thought that's, that's not good for either my creativity or my spirituality or just myself. It's not healthy. Um, mm. And I thought, okay, how do we just balance that? So one of the things I'm really looking forward to here is, is as as the, the residential side builds, that it's that it just insists and helps me to notice what's real and what's pre you know where am I mm -hmm. present? Um, and I I think things like the music and the creativity fit into that. Then there's space for that. Um, I, you know that would be my experience uh, that if I keep busy what I keep being is about being external and out mm. meeting people whereas the more that I can be still mm. the more when I pick up a guitar at home there's a song in it the yeah. more when I you know so it's that trying to be present but again I'm good at words the difficulty is action 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think a lot of people can resonate with that or identify with it. Um, when it comes to song, um, and particularly like, you know, there's ancient songs and traditional songs and songs from the canon, and then there's obviously their their world of original song and i'm wondering what are your thoughts on um you know in the folk tradition just carving out your own space and finding your own voice in that i think it's really important when i started um being involved in the the folk and traditional scene i was totally overawed by people who came from particular families and carried you know amazing history so they grew up singing songs that i couldn't even pronounce i i find that i have a couple of songs for example as Gaelga, but when i when i sing in irish I worry about the phonetics and I, I some so I have to really, really know a song well before I trust myself with it that I so that I'm present. For me, it's very important when you're singing something that you can actually close your eyes and you could get totally distracted, but you're still in the song mm. that it's, it's gone into your bones. Um, I think uh, own and like folk tradition is actually about the now. And one of the things we can do is is uh, go into a kind of a nostalgia of and, and, and I see I, I mean, I came to a church as well. We have this mis mistaking tradition for nostalgia or sentimentality and like there's nothing wrong with any of those there's gorgeous songs that are there because sure we're fierce fond of the sound of them and they just sound warm and that's why they're so popular but there's nothing wrong with sitting and saying for example um Michael Fortune and Aileen Lambert have a great um, program different projects that they do around folk music and they would have got a group of us together and said what about um writing songs in the folk tradition for children because a lot of the folk songs for children uh, can be you know they're singing songs about famine and you're like that that's not really appropriate for a seven-year-old in the flacchiole or the fish let's so we wrote loads of funny songs i wrote a song about lowry lynch having horses ears which is the old tradition uh and wrote a great song about granny um who let out an enormous fart um, which every six or seven year old can't loves. go wrong with farts yeah <laughs> exactly so you know um uh catherine and colin wrote a beautiful one about bridget's cloak and just by writing all different songs uh we allow you allow children into the tradition and then people find what they love and follow it mm. um i think we're very lucky we have things like the itma the irish traditional music archives where people can go and just look up so much stuff. But even here in County Clare, the, the library has an amazing um, resource that came from um, Pat McKenzie and um, Jim Carroll. And it's like all these songs and singers. You go into the library and you can look up by song or by singer in Clare and find hundreds and hundreds of songs that they just went around and recorded. Wow. Um, yeah, which is just a huge gift. And they most of the bulk of their work is actually going to go to UL Music Academy to be shared and to be available um, to the public. And that's a huge gift. So song collectors, and I mean, this whole area, Tom Munley, you know, all of these people collecting songs, sharing songs, so that we don't just think that all of the tradition comes from us. We have a sense of where we stand and the shoulders we stand on. But part of the tradition is allowing things to, to grow and to move and to shape. Mm. Um, and some of the songs I'll sing, people will presume that their tradition, the city of Chicago, Luca Bloom is a, is a typical one. People assume that's in the tradition. Mm -hmm. and, and Luca wrote that when his brother was going to America. You know, so there's songs that have, they evolve and, and they catch meaning for people according to what matters and where mm. we're at. Um, I sang that song, Note of Truth, last night for the first time in about four years, which is why I remembered it for today. And it's all about, it was leaving Cork and, and about song sessions being good. But as I was sitting and there was a group of people who'd been talking about how important it was and their grandfather in America used to sing and all that, I suddenly realised that it connected to people's experience who were in the room. And I thought, gosh, that's the beauty of coming back to something. So it's not that it's, um, it's not the particular age of it. It's not the particular, but they're like, I love learning the old songs. And I love someone like Thomas McCarthy now who'd come back and would have mm. songs that he got from his mother and would correct the, the way you sing one word, don't you know, that's an and, not an of, because he got it that way from his mother who insisted that he didn't forget the words. And it turned out that like a song that was 150 years old that he got in an oral tradition, he has exactly the same. He got through his mother exactly the same as what was written down 150 years ago. Mm. Now, people who've pulled them all off the internet and who've learned all these things and done all their courses, mightn't have the same tradition branch through. So I think all of these things are good, appreciating the old, knowing about them, learning from them, and then just not being afraid to, to celebrate mm. and sing. And I think there's so much happening now. Like I want to hear the songs about lockdown. I want to hear people writing songs about trying to be an artist in the middle of this time. I want to hear people paint and write and talk about 
this moment in history, which is unprecedented, because not only were we locked down, but we could all communicate. So we had this huge, um, what's the word? As, as a friend of mine said, we were jolted into monasticism. We yeah. were both live like monks with no skills. And then we had all of this technology coming at us. Um, so part of the folk tradition is actually who's recording all of this, who's who's painting not the statistics, but what's underneath, what, what, it, what it did to us as people, um, how we experience ourselves now when we try to be together, how we experience ourselves, uh, how, you know, how we untense ourselves from being brave and try and just be in the space and say, that was what I experienced and it wasn't perfect and I didn't handle it as well as I thought I would. Mm. Uh, how can I sing about that? What sound does that make? Um, I think, and I'm sure there's loads of artists doing really good work on that now, just trying to articulate that for people. So that a bit like the person for who is hearing the song from America, who says, that's the job of songs. It helped me access that. I want people who are articulating things that in a year's time, when I hear a song or when I hear a piece of music, I go, that was what I was trying to say. And I didn't mm. know how to, you know, I think that's the gift of, of art and creativity. You know, that was something I was trying to say and I just couldn't put language on it. Yeah. Look, there it is with no language. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And and particularly poetry as well is another, you know, world where in a three words or an image can say yeah. a world or a verse yeah. of, um, you know, it just cuts to the core, I suppose. Yeah. 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 I'm thinking of, um, is it John Culloch or McCulloch? I'll check his name now. He's a British, um, an English poet and he wrote, he's a beautiful piece. The effervescence is, is on us again. I don't have it to hand now, but it's that, um, the phosphorus when it when it comes in on tides in certain places in panic yeah. it goes bright blue do you know that and he's yeah. a beautiful poem about how when we get this panic and nervousness in it that 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 sets and we don't know how to deal with it this mm. we're on the tide and and i remember reading that during lockdown and thinking i never thought about it but there's a color in me that's reacting there's a bit of me that's just going sending off some vibe that some creature could probably see and say She's not well, <laughs> mm. you know, and, and, and being able to articulate that was so special. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Nora, the other thing I'd, I'd like to talk about is, um, you know, you're you seem to be someone that's um, very much obviously on the local level and the community level, but you're you're very interested and engaged in around social issues in general um, mm -hmm. on a national or uh, indeed a global level. Um, can you tell me where that sort of awareness maybe started off in your life or where it came from? Yeah. Do you mean, Rory, that I'm very opinionated on things? <laughs> I have an opinion on lots of things. Yeah, um, we discussed this, I remember, at home one time um, because in my family there, there'd be that strand and uh, just said the one thing that when we were growing up we were always told was, uh, don't worry, it's not about how you do in school, even though we were warned to do well in school. It's not about how you do, but be good people and be kind. Be good people and be kind was just repeated. And I would have grown up in very traditional um, Catholic home, you know. Um, I, I often joke about how, like, um, my dad at night, my mum would say, We must say prayers. And my mum would want us to sit down and say the rosary. And my, my dad would say, What do you want to say to Jesus tonight? And what do you want to talk about? And we'd have a chat. So I grew up in quite traditional, you know, um, uh, 1980s. Uh, I was a teenager, 1980s in Ireland, you know, at that particular world. And I think uh, travel, of course, opens you up. I lived in Germany for a year, yeah. years a bit. And then I was very lucky when I was in Clare a little while. I can't remember how it happened, but myself and Anne Rain and Elaine Dalton. Elaine works for the Women's Collective the um, uh, for women in Clare. And Anne had been, was a chairperson of that at the time. And uh, they said to me, we're trying to create something different. The Festival of Feminisms, it turned out. Will we meet on Wednesdays for coffee? So every morning between nine and about 11, we'd meet for coffee for about a year until we and we kept talking about how we don't really want programs to fix people. We want to listen to each other's stories. And I found that just created. I just got this huge access to a world that I would have thought I was very engaged, but really it was within a very small world. It was within mm. my world. I was concerned about particular issues that came up around us. But suddenly I got a kind of an analysis. And, and a way of seeing things in a frame rather than seeing like this person has been had a bad, badly dealt a hand or we can, you know, we'll have a, a collection for that person. I began to start to say, well, why are people homeless? Why are people hungry? How can we pretend we don't see domestic violence? You know, um, 
all of those questions started to come up and and we had three i was involved in organizing three of the uh, silence plus voice fe feminist festivals in in ennis and where we had the bones of 200 people at, at any weekend um and it was fascinating it was fascinating to be involved in conversations where people said oh if only women speak it can't be equal and you'd say well we're trying to listen to women's voices what about coming along and listening yeah no i wouldn't be i wouldn't be welcome if i was only listening and and trying to just un help people to unpack and to notice what what was being said in that and to begin to hear things um there's loads of stories i remember i could talk about for for a week but they were we every time we had somebody sharing a story a story of the experience of being homeless in Clare, the story of the experience of being um, in direct provision, the story of the experience of, you know, trying to apply for asylum, of, you know, of being deaf. I remember amazing stuff from the deaf community. Each of them kind of opened a, opened something in me, you know, and, and you start to say, wow, you know, this isn't simply about lots of individual things. It's overall a basic understanding of how the world works and who we see and who we just don't notice that we don't see. Um, and I'd credit that for a lot. Like also then, of course, on Facebook, I, I would be a relatively quiet person. If there's an argument going on, while I can get a bit passionate, generally it takes a lot to get me into a row in a pub. Um, I'd be like, don't cause a scene. Let's not me. I found a forum where you could say out loud, this doesn't strike me as this. This doesn't make sense. How do I think that doesn't, that doesn't seem fair. It opened up a lot of stuff. Now, some of it was challenging, but for me, it became a space where I could articulate. It's a bit like I notice now with Twitter, people can kind of come in and ask something directly. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes they get murdered and there's loads of negative in that. But in allowing people to say, why is that that way? Um, we hear the huge backlash of, of course, you don't possibly, couldn't possibly understand. Of course, there's a reason. And that backlash tells you, I hit a nerve. Let's just hold steady now and see what emerges. Mm. And, and I've, I've been fascinated over the years, really. It's not, I, don't, I think, I mean, there's a level that I'm a keyboard warrior, that I have lots of opinions. I'm involved in organizing different things. I have, I'm aware and concerned at the moment. Um, a lot of things around um, the environment would be of interest to me. Um, but I, I think that uh, it's not that I think I have the answers. I, I mean, I've grown out of that point of saying, thinking that like, I know what we need to talk about. I know mm. the answers. I think I don't have the answers, but I do have a sense that if we're willing to see everybody, if we're willing to recognize each person, then the answers emerge. The issue is often where we say, I don't want to see that person. I don't want to include that person. I don't want to think about that, that experience, you know, that some people are having that experience. If we could, as soon as we start doing that, it becomes I am the norm and the only way to do mm -hmm. things. And that's when we're in trouble. Uh, so I would give huge credit to people like Anne, Elaine and the Women's Network and all of the, the just the brave people who stood up and told their stories. You know, I remember hearing a, a, a very a lovely young woman in direct provision talking about her experience and about something very basic and very practical. And a woman who was sitting further back, I can see them both. I just won't name them, but who was sitting listening and she put up her hands and I want to tell you that I grew up in Dublin in the 50s and my mother stole food to feed us. And you're a great mother, just like my mother was. And you know that that seeing each other, um, it, it just catches my heart. And I think for me, I've just been really lucky to have experiences where people just broke my heart open uh, so that I could see more. Um, and I'll keep talking about it because I think that's the, that's the way every so often people say to me, will you ever calm down? And I say, I hope not. But um, yeah. yeah, it's yes. that. Direct provision is an interesting one in particular because um, it, they, they tend to be centres that are hidden on the margins of towns. And there's some kind of echo for me anyway in Magdalene Laundries is that they're out of sight, out of mind. Absolutely. And that, that's very convenient for the powers that be. But there can be a complicity then among the population that, well, I'm sure I don't know anything about that. But yeah. I mean, there are people I meet that say they don't know anything about direct provision still, but there has been OK, it's been 22 years now, I think, but certainly in the last five years, a lot has been said and done about it, documentaries and TV and radio and campaigns and promises to close it that have failed and so on. Um, but in Clare, then we have direct vision. We have a few centres and and we now have, you know, several thousand Ukrainian people as well. But mm -hmm. I suppose this is the challenge that we could get on with our happy lives and choose not to get involved or to know. But they're choices you make as well, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I think what we're, I'm lucky, Rory, is 
I lived in Germany in the 90s. They had a lot of this. Um, so we were an English speaking community. So we looked out for places we could serve volunteers English. And one of the places we did was we helped with homework clubs and summer camps for children in direct provision. They had a different name on it, mm. but it was the same thing. Yeah. Um, so I found myself out among that and saying, isn't it horrendous that people are given a tiny amount of money? And if they do any, like if they get on the train without a ticket, it's marked down that they are a criminal. Uh, you know, if they try and, you know, they're, they're, I saw the thing of people, families living in one room with all their shoes outside the door in a prefab and trying to share kitchens. I saw all of that stuff. So I remember being so horrified when I came home mm. because I knew that those who were implementing this knew it didn't work. Mm. It, well, it worked precisely for the thing of trying to deter people, mm. but it would use those who had arrived here as a bargaining chip or as a, as a, 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 a you know, a, a, a gap to try and stop others from coming. It was blocking people and, and breaking lives in order that others don't come. And it's that basic notion that we own Ireland, which is just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. None of us own any of us, you know, and we own Ireland and get to decide who gets in here. We own Ireland and get to decide that certain children who are born here don't need to go to school here or don't can go to school, but don't need to be able to access college here. You know, all of these things that we're just it's totally unconscious because we don't see each person. And I, I think you're dead right. That that thing of keeping people at the margins has been for me probably the biggest learning. And I say that as somebody who's grown up and been deeply involved in the Catholic Church for most of my life. Um, so to recognize how little I could see, how much I had said the world is this shape and realize it's all of this, but I had only learned to see this much, you know, has been the, the revelation or the the salvation of my life in many ways, because um I remember the time all the reports came out, um, the, the horrible reports about uh, diocese. There was reports about uh, Magdalena laundries and that. And I said to a friend, I said, I'm spinning because every time I face somebody with compassion, I have my back to somebody else I know who's hurt. And I'm trying to, I can't, I just can't take this in. And I had to step completely back and, you know, say what matters, what's possible, what are the issues? Um, and get beyond just trying to be everybody's friend and get on with everyone. And I think for me, that was the, the first learning was that if we want to make a difference, we need to talk about systems, not just trying to be everybody's friend, because that's a charity model of I, I help people. I'm a nice person. Mm. And I think that's why that's the problem with direct provision is that we're all trying to help instead of saying just the system has to go like you can't trap people like this. Sorry, I'm talking to the converted. Mm. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, the, you hit, hit something for me in the, the charity thinking it's uh, it can often be such a, a short term feel good panacea where you sort of get a nice adrenaline high for putting the money in the bucket or donating the whatever you're donating. And, um, you know, charity is a poor substitute for justice and rights. And you're basically I think Ireland is addicted to charity to some extent. And. Mm -hmm. It it means we're caught in a kind of a debt a debt cycle of always having more problems because we always then need ch more charity to fix the problems rather than actually asking why those problems exist in the first place. Wise man, that's that's well said. Yeah, I think it's that. Yeah, that spiral. I think ultimately there's a belief that we couldn't really be responsible for ourselves. We we go to it all go to pot. So we'll we'll pay anyone to take care of our schools, our hospitals, mm -hmm. our social services. We'll put any system in place that we'll put money at. But the thing of actually really talking and choosing, we're we're very nervous of that. Um, mm. But now, uh, I mean, I suppose I think that's one of the gifts of the arts when we're talking about arts and creativity, is to help people to put language to that. Um, uh, and I think the more and more that we're seeing and hearing uh, of, with diversity, um, different voices, different expressions, it allows people to access and hear that which, um, you know, people will say, oh, I'm so, so terribly surprised to hear all of this. Like, But we just have to keep plowing the field and opening up the spaces and talking about and not saying we're just now. I'm very conscious that we don't simply insist that those who are the victims and who are suffering in any of these situations have to permanently tell their stories because that's just exhausting mm. work. But I mean, people like ourselves who have privilege, well, people like myself, I shouldn't presume, who has privilege, who has access. You know, I would very consciously say I have access to a number of Catholic spaces. So it's like, how can I use that privilege to get a voice in there? Mm. You know, I sent an article into um, a, a magazine recently on domestic violence because I wanted to sit in a lot of homes, a lot of Catholic homes that open it and say, oh, I didn't, I thought it would be a sin if I talked about this. 
actually no it says here that i'm supposed to and i'm in, totally entitled to walk away from abuse the same you know you put you you kind of say how do you use your space i have the the poor irish bishops demented i'm forever sending them emails or things um you know use your privilege wherever yeah. you can yeah. so that so that the most vulnerable people in the room don't always have to be the bravest um and i i actually think it does tie back a little bit to, for me anyway Rory, with that thing of trying to quieten down and integrate you know when you say where's the quiet and all you're going when you're going all the time and it's always a, a crisis kind of like the housing stuff now it's all a crisis the constant movement keeps you busy and you never really have to look at the fact that this is a miserable way to be organized in a country you yeah. know if we could stop and say for six months the only thing we're doing is starting this and we're going to turn up whatever systems we have to turn up but we're going to start this that no child goes to bed at night not knowing where they'll sleep tomorrow um you know we could make it but actually sometimes it's easier to be busy you know now everybody's trying their best everybody has good ideas it's just to find ways to, to slow down and see what is and then to choose to see everybody equal and, and present um makes it sound easy doesn't it so <laughs> well yeah i suppose like the you know ultimately what you're getting at is that there is a system in operation whether it's conscious or unconscious there is a system and it has a massive bearing on people's lives and it ultimately doesn't serve a huge amount of people now it does serve a certain amount of people very very well <laughs> and it, it, for a reason. it yes. serves extra helpings as well mm -hmm. um, but i suppose in order to address that we can do a critical analysis of the system but in order to do so we need to step back review and reflect and then reorganize rather than just keep ramming our heads into it absolutely um, i suppose that's the um adrenaline trap that civil society can end up in as well is that you're just constantly head banging and eventually that's going to only lead to one thing which is going to be you're going to get, get exhausted and end up having to give up or you simply won't be as effective so yeah. i suppose that's where the kind of renewal aspect comes in i think yeah yeah um i'm thinking of two things one is that uh from the from my tradition uh the christian tradition they keep saying to people who are in who are activists whatever area they're activists mm. in feeding the poor whatever you have to have contemplation daily without contemplation daily some yeah. kind of quietness you have nothing to draw from and so you'll burn out and yeah. if you only have contemplation and no action you become this kind of airy fairy mystic -y person who's not really grounded so it's that balance mm. the other thing i'm thinking of actually it just came into my mind as we started to, to, and there was uh ron kavanagh has a great song a song alone can't change the world that is true but we can sound a warning me and you exploit others in our name uh, line your pockets uh, um, then we will point the blame in our songs and our songs and he just sings about how like what we can do is name things and in naming things mm. they cease to have this secret power mm. you know in naming and including and you know as simple as saying the school bus system was set up and we for people forgot to include a particular direct provision center or, or to, to include some Ukrainian children who needed to get to school in the morning some of that is just accidental and some of that is we the system doesn't see certain people mm. so naming takes away the kind of the secret power or the fear of if we say something we'll be be in trouble and again we who have privilege are able to do that mm. um i'm just thinking as as a tiny aside in terms of privilege um there's a new film being launched uh just today it's going to be on um youtube originals the letter which is uh Pope Francis uh, brought together people who are involved in um, environmental activism. Um, he sent him out a letter and invited them to meet him and to talk about it. But I was listening to a woman, Lorna Gold, who's in it. She's based in Maynooth, she's a Scottish woman based in Maynooth. But she was saying, like, we had all this message to share and we didn't know, how do you get that to a young person? How do you get that to people who don't read letters anymore? So we went and talked to this guy who had made, he, I think he made My Octopus Teacher and things like that, some really nice movies. And he said, oh, we said, we want to make a movie about this. And he was like, yeah, but there's no plot. It's a letter. <laughs> so they had to have this conversation. How do you engage? So they invited a number of different people to share their stories. And so to me, that's using your privilege. That's mm. saying, OK, yeah, what can yeah. we do that gets those voices? Because I looked at the activists who are involved now to be out tonight and I didn't recognize any of them. You know, but there's a guy from Senegal who's 16. There's a young girl mm. from mm. India. There's a couple who are involved in coral reef stuff in Hawaii. There's, you know, a guy from the Amazon yeah. and to use your privilege. To, so I think maybe the thing I'd be saying is that uh, I recognize the need for stillness in order to be alive and active. 
and I recognize the need to see everybody and to, to use the privilege that I've been given to, to make sure yeah. they're seen yeah. more. And, and, and it sends also the gifts and resources and platforms that you have at your disposal, one of which is song and music. And, um, you know, you're 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 talking about like the power of song to move emotions, but they're obviously the folk tradition in particular has a, a very strong political consciousness to it in terms of, I suppose, a lot of my own education has been through the realm of song. It certainly wasn't through the curriculum in, you know, I, I don't I don't remember actually hearing, learning very much at all about social injustice at, at school. Now, I know that it changes and it varies by school and by teacher, but um, song historically in folk song has has a huge role to play, doesn't it? Yeah, it, well, Frank Hart would say, and his festival is just over in, in Dublin that last weekend, he'd say the those in power write the story, those who suffer write the songs. Mm. Um, and actually, that's one of the reasons I like the old songs. You pick up a song and you're, you're drawn into stories of people who don't, who wouldn't have the voice to write a book or to be to have a statue put up for them. Um, I was at Chris Drever in Kilkee only a week ago, two weeks, maybe three weeks ago, and he had a lovely song about Scapa Flow, which is um, a place in Scotland where the German Navy was sent at the end of World War One while they decided what to do with them. And the men were left on for six months in boats. The food parcels had to come from Germany. Nobody fed them, gave them clean water. They weren't allowed off the boats. And in utter misery, when, around the time the armistice was to be signed and everything was to be finished, they scuttled the whole Navy. It was the last bit of power they had. And it was the last, you know. Um, and I, I just was totally caught up in this story because I was thinking, I know the names of all the leaders. I never knew that the German soldiers, the German marine, um, uh, mariners sunk their ships in an attempt to say, like, we can't be heard. Nobody's listening to us. We have to do something. And at least in doing this, another army isn't going to get these ships. Now, there's all kinds of reasons they did. There's all kinds of stories. But it's that thing of where do we learn the stories? Where do we hear the stories? Um, that African proverb, what is it? Until lions can write, only hunters will, hunters will always be victors until lions can write the story. Mm -hmm. um, so like all the time it's sharing the story. And I find that it's creating spaces for stillness and that kind of sharing of songs and things allows stuff to come up because we're not nervous. We're not mm -hmm. as defensive if we allow things to come up um, and then things emerge and you just kind of find yourself saying, God, I never knew you had that whole aspect here. I never knew you knew those songs or, you know, and, and things can emerge. Like, I think that Dermot Petty's play and the Renine Ambush now is really interesting two days in September. It's going to be in Milltown this weekend. It's going to like talk about something that is history that's very hard to talk about and that people don't mm -hmm. often talk about. And here we have it up on a stage. What conversations will that create? Mm -hmm. What, you know, what connections will be made? So um, art makes everything possible, doesn't it? It opens up. It mm. opens us up, really, in ways that we didn't know we needed to. Yeah. I think that's a wonderful way to end. Noreen is uh, art makes everything possible. It opens us up in ways that, you know, endless ways. And um, and you're a huge part of that, as are there's so many other people on this podcast. But we're, we're blessed to be living in a in a real rich, um, Rich right, place, right. rich county, rich country, so rich. full of um, great creative souls. And right. um, long may well, continue. Thanks for inviting me. And that was my thought when you invited me. I thought, wow, well, there's so many people out there. I've really enjoyed listening to their story and that. So it is an honor to be included. But it's been it's been great. And uh, just to say to people, they're heartily welcome to call in. If, if I'm here at all, they're welcome to call in to Spanish right. points. They can find me. So thanks very much, Noreen. Thanks. Rory. Thank you.